Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Richard Griscom and I am the host for and, and the speaker for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation. And then we will have time to address questions and comments afterwards. Um, just to provide a brief introduction, again, my name is Richard Griscom, and I am a postdoctoral researcher at Leiden University. I am now starting our research project together with Andrew Harvey and Martin Mouse, which focuses on the documentation of Hadza, a language isolate of northern Tanzania. My doctoral dissertation, defended at the University of Oregon, focuses on aspects of verbal morphosyntax in SMJ de Toga, and the presentation today expands on one section of that dissertation. So today I'm going to be talking about a set of cognate constructions in the Southern Nilotic family, which variably have been described as passive constructions, uh, third person plural subject constructions, and then also impersonal constructions. So as we can see in this example from the Tugan language of Kenya, the child was beaten. The verbal prefix ki here is glossed as a passive. In this second example from Gisamjanga de Toga of Tanzania, they will catch them. We see the verbal prefix a, which is cognate with the key from the first example. Here it is glossed as third person plural. Now in a third language, Chedangain of Kenya, we see another cognate prefix uh, here, ki and k, based on the uh, underlying ATR value of the, the verbal root. Uh, in this sense, a hole is left so that the door can be built. These two prefixes are glossed as impersonal. So what I'm going to argue today is that the most accurate analysis of these constructions is that they are indeed impersonal constructions. So I'd like to first go through the formal and functional properties of these constructions uh, and talk a little bit about some variation that we see as reported in the literature on Southern Nilotic languages. Um, I'd like to uh, propose that they are best analyzed as impersonal constructions based on some of these properties. Uh, and then finally, I want to talk briefly just about uh, any new insights that we get from this data uh, regarding some of the typological generalizations that have been proposed in the literature. So first, just some brief background. Uh, the Southern Nilotic family is a subfamily of the larger Nilotic family together with the Eastern Nilotic and Western Nilotic subfamilies. Uh, the Nilotic family itself is oftentimes uh, associated with the Nilo-Saharan phylum. Uh, the internal uh, structure of the Southern Nilotic family is proposed by Rotland 1982, uh, which is commonly adopted uh, even today is that there are two primary uh, branches. There's the Kalenjin branch, which consists of languages spoken in, uh, mostly in Kenya and Uganda. And then a second branch, Amotic de Toga, which has two sub-branches, the de Toga varieties, and then uh, the Moribund language, Amotic. So just in terms of the geographical distribution of these languages, here we see a language map of Kenya, and the Kalenjin languages of Kenya are here indicated in black here on the, the western border with Uganda. And if we look at the Ugandan map, we see uh, just a, a, a small area where there are Kalenjin languages spoken again on the, the border with Kenya. And then in the language map of Tanzania, we see some areas where it's indicated that Toga is spoken. Um, and as I, I said in one of my last pre presentations, uh, Datoga is actually spoken uh, in many more areas than uh, are indicated in this map. Um, but another thing is that the Southern Nilotic language, Akia, is also spoken in Tanzania. Um, the, the speakers are kind of interspersed with Maasai speakers in the Maasai steppe in this kind of uh, peak, pink area here. Uh, then if we put these maps together, this is sort of a rough amalgamation of those three previous maps. This just shows the uh, the relative geographic location of these speaker communities. So briefly, just some uh, relevant typological features that, um, that might be uh, useful for today's discussion. Uh, Southern Nilotic languages are typically described as verb initial, but they often exhibit flexible word order. Uh, they are pro-drop languages, 
They have both prefixing and suffixing verbal morphology. And uh, notably here, uh, subject indexation is indicated through prefixes and object indexation is coded through suffixes. Uh, there's grammatical and lexical tone, and then also varying degrees of ATR harmony. So now I wanna just provide some brief uh, background on this uh, concept of the impersonal. So first I wanna say that the use of the term impersonal varies quite widely throughout the literature. Uh, and there's not, I would not say that there's actual consensus about what exactly constitutes uh, the impersonal. Uh, there is, however, a volume dedicated to the subject from 2011. And in that volume, they offer the, the definition of impersonal constructions as those that lack a referential subject. A second definition provided in another chapter of that book is that impersonal constructions are those that register a loss of the functional subject properties, such as uh, definiteness, topicality, and agentivity. So clearly, uh, these definitions of impersonal constructions, they, they assume or rely on a subject category. And subject itself is, is sometimes a, a controversial concept, uh, but there are some features that are oftentimes associated with uh, the notion of subject. Um, so typically it's said that a prototypical subject is a referent that is referential, that is it refers to a concrete entity or individual uh, that's definite, so a unique and familiar or identifiable referent that's topical, so an entity that a speaker identifies about which then information is given. Uh, it's animate, meaning that it's alive, and it's volitional or agentive, meaning that it, it has control over some sort of action. Now in that same volume on impersonal constructions, uh, there were five proposed functional types of constructions. Those include non-referential subject constructions, indefinite subject constructions, non-topical subject constructions, inanimate subject constructions, and non-volitional or non-agentive subject constructions. Although it is conceded that there is uh, oftentimes overlap between these functional types. Uh, these types are further generalized into three broad categories. Those of R impersonals, which include the non-referential subject and indefinite subject constructions. T impersonals, which consists of just the non-topical subject constructions and A impersonals, which consist of inanimate subject not, and non-volitional or non-agentive subject constructions. And for today's presentation, we'll be mostly focusing on uh, what uh, they categorize as R impersonals and T impersonals. So these R impersonals first, again, these are sensitive to uh, properties related to referentiality and definiteness. Oftentimes these are expressed through uh, a lexical form, a pronominal form, or maybe a, a special verbal form. If it's a lexical form, it's uh, quite common for it to be the word for person or people. If it's a pronominal form, which could be a free pronoun or bound pronoun on, uh, attached to a verb, for example, this could be the numeral one, it could be a pronominalized form of the word person, or it could be a personal pronoun of some kind. Uh, but also there can be special verbal constructions which are dedicated to this uh, kind of impersonal meaning. Then for the team personals, which again uh, relate to uh, topicality, those more often involve uh, word order inversions and then also the loss of agreement. So going back to those uh, three subtypes that fall under the R impersonals and T impersonals, non-referential subjects, uh, the indefinite subjects, and the non-topical subjects. I just wanna show some examples uh, that have been provided in the literature to give you an idea for what sort of constructions uh, we're looking at when we're discussing impersonal constructions so that we can see how the Southern Nilotic constructions kind of uh, fit into this inventory of constructions. So this first example, number four from Guarani, uh, this is what you might call a, a weather verb construction uh, or a, a dummy subject construction. Here we have a third person singular uh, prefix on the verb rain uh, here indicating some sort of non-referential subject. So, so something is raining, some non-referential entity is, is causing the rain to occur. 
And we see something similar in example five from Kiowa. Yesterday it was hot, but here rather than third person singular, we have third person plural. So this is just to show that uh, it's quite common for it to be singular or plural, uh, but most often third, uh, third person. Uh, also, uh, presentational constructions are sometimes included under this umbrella term of non-referential subjects. So something like uh, there is a chair and that might be considered a non-referential subject using the, um, using the word there as kind of uh, refer uh, referring to some sort of uh, entity of some kind. Okay, now turning to indefinite subjects, um, here we see some, uh, well, example six uh, from Estonian, the sentence at, at that time, one mainly read fiction. Here we see that indefinite subjects uh, oftentimes indicate some sort of human referent of some kind. Uh, so here there's a dedicated verbal construction here in an in, in personal verbal construction uh, that also codes past tense. Whereas in example seven from Dutch, uh, they've asked me to say something. Here we have a, a, um, a pronoun, uh, men, which uh, comes from the word for, uh, for man. Um, here referring to a kind of a indefinite, unspecified uh, human referent, uh, in this case, plural. So they have asked me to say something. In terms of non-topical subjects, uh, again, oftentimes these involve uh, changes in the word order. So here an example from Russian, uh, 8A, the boy came in, and 8B, a boy came in, or there entered a boy. Uh, we have exactly the same words. Uh, the only difference is that the order of those words has switched. So in 8A, we have boy, and then the verb come with uh, in the third person singular past form. And then AAB, we have the verb come first, and then boy following. So again, this is uh, a claim to be related to the topicality of the subject. Uh, in other languages, like in Swahili, uh, we, see, uh, we see some change of word order, but then also changes in terms of agreement on the verb. So in 9a, mtoto alikuwa nyumbani, the child is in the house, we see that the, there is uh, subject indexation on the verb agreeing with uh, the noun class of the, the subject, toto, child. In 9b, there was a child in the house, nyumbani kulikuwa nam toto. Uh, here we see that the, the locative phrase has been fronted to the beginning of the clause, but then also the agreement on the verb has changed uh, to, to match. Oh, here it's indicated as infinitive. It could also be considered uh, class 15. Uh, to indicate that it's agreeing with the locative phrase. Okay, we also see in some other languages such as Oromo here uh, that there is dedicated morphology that codes topicality. So in 10a, the girl bought a sheep. Here the girl is a topic. This is uh, most likely uh, indicated through uh, uh, measurements of topic continuity um, so that it's uh, easy for the analyst to tell that this is uh, the topic of discussion is the girl. Uh, so in this case, uh, the girl is, the topicality of the girl is coded through this suffix n, whereas in 10b, uh, in this example, the girl is not the topic of discussion. Uh, so that uh, suffix n is not present. Okay, briefly I wanna touch about, uh, I wanna touch on the contrast between impersonal constructions and passive constructions because there's a lot of overlap between the two. So the passive construction um, was famously described by Shibatani in 1985 as primarily coding uh, agent defocusing. That is uh, rather than uh, patient uh, focusing, um, it's agent defocusing. So much of the previous literature had described the passive as uh, kind of promoting the object or focusing on the patient, but Shibatani claims that the primary function of the passive is, is actually to defocus the agent. Uh, so we see that a very similar thing is happening with impersonal constructions, but there are some differences with the passive constructions, and that primary difference is in terms of the morphosyntactic coding of the most active participant, so the agent, and the least active participant, the patient. So in passive constructions, the 
uh, subject is the one that is affected. So that means that the patient is coded as the subject, whereas the agent is either not encoded or is perhaps coded as, uh, as an oblique phrase of some kind. So here we see a big difference. So within personal constructions, the agent is a subject, but is lacking some sort of standard uh, semantic or morphosyntactic features. Uh, and if there is a patient, then it is coded as the object. Uh, whereas in passive constructions, the agent is omitted or is an oblique phrase, whereas the patient is coded as the subject. One more thing to point out here is that uh, and personal constructions can co-occur with intransitive verb roots, whereas passive constructions typically cannot. Okay, so again, I'm arguing that the constructions uh, under discussion in Southern Nilotic uh, are best analyzed as impersonal constructions. So uh, just to give a brief, uh, a brief background on the morphological structure of verbs in Southern Nilotic. We start with a verb root. We'll see that we have prefixes and suffixes. And in terms of uh, subject and object indexation, again, subject indexation uh, consists of prefixes and verb, uh, and sorry, object indexation consists of suffixes. And um, most often third person object indexation is a zero morph, uh, which uh, will be important later in this talk. Uh, subject indexation, um, Typically, it, it, for some languages, uh, does not include any zero morphs, but um, in some in some Colangian languages, the third person form uh, is actually a zero morph. In terms of the impersonal constructions, though, they um, they operate within this same paradigm as the the regular uh, uh, personal subject indexation. And um, the most common semantic features of these impersonal constructions is that they refer to human and plural reference, oftentimes not definite and usually not topical, although I'll show that uh, we don't really have the data yet to, uh, to demonstrate that. In terms of the actual uh, forms that the impersonal construction takes, uh, we'll see here's a, a non-exhaustive list of Southern Nilotic languages and the impersonal prefixes on the right. So first we see that um, most of the prefixes are quite similar. So they have a, a, a voiceless viewer stop uh, followed by some sort of high or, or mid front vowel. Uh, we also see that the uh, Datoga impersonal is, is distinct from most of the, the other impersonal constructions. Uh, but another interesting thing, if we look at the first person plural subject indexation forms for these same languages, we see that in almost all cases, they are exactly the same. And this has been uh, described in the literature and is something I'll, I'll talk about now uh, with reference specifically to Datoga. So uh, some of the literature actually describes the impersonal and the first person plural as the same prefix. And um, some publications actually describe them as being separate things. So now I'm going to look at some data uh, specifically from Asim J. Toga. So this uh, comes from my, uh, my work as a, a PhD student at the University of Oregon. So I conducted research in these uh, four communities of uh, the Asim J. Toga of northern Tanzania. And uh, again, first I want to talk a little bit about this um, shared identity between the impersonal construction and the first person plural subject indexation. So uh, segmentally, they are identical. Uh, so uh, comparing just a, a kind of a general first person plural construction to an impersonal construction, oftentimes they can only be differentiated based on the verbal tone or the uh, presence or lack thereof of this uh, so-called final suffix or inflectional suffix. So in example 11, uh, we do it. Um, we see that we have uh, a similar verb tone uh, to that of example 12, it is done, but there's a, a final suffix which uh, distinguishes the two. Uh, we also see that uh, both of these prefixes, uh, they follow the same uh, ATR patterns. So if the verb root uh, exhibits a minus ATR pattern, then 
the prefix will change accordingly. That goes for both the impersonal prefix and then also the first person plural prefix. Uh, in some cases, the distinction between these two constructions is purely tonal. So in what I call in my dissertation, the dependent stem construction, which here is uh, essentially like an exhortative construction as in example 15, let's do it. Um, in example 16, it should be done or that it may be done. Here, the only difference between the two is tonal. Uh, just to reinforce this, uh, this idea that the first person plural subject indexation and the impersonal prefix might be exactly the same thing. Um, there is a suppletive form C, which is a prefix that is used in temporal and conditional constructions. So as we see in example 17 and 18, if we burn it and if it is burnt, uh, we have uh, exactly the same prefix or what appears to be the same prefix. Uh, with the same tonal patterns. Again, the only difference here is the presence of the final suffix. All right, in terms of the types of constructions that we see the impersonal prefix used in, uh, there are definite plural subject constructions. Uh, those are the most common. So as an example 19, in the old days people fetched water with gourds, or in the old days gourds were used to fetch water. Uh, so here the impersonal prefix is referring to just kind of uh, people in general, uh, maybe the Asim Jig Toga or some kind of generic sense of people. Uh, I have one example in all of my data that I've found so far of the indefinite um, or of the impersonal uh, prefix co-occurring with a lexical subject in P. Uh, so in this example, often people ate even these clothes uh, here again, the impersonal prefix is referring to this sort of generic notion of people, but it also co-occurs with the word bunet, uh, here uh, referring to people. So this is again very rare, uh, but it is uh, interesting because it, it, uh, it kind of reinforces this idea that there's this uh, subject, but it is referring to this uh, notion of a, a group of people. Uh, we also see the, the impersonal prefix used in context in which we would infer that the subject is a single individual. So in example 21, I was born in Holokat. Uh, here the, the impersonal prefix co-occurs with a, a verb root that oftentimes uh, when it's used with a personal prefix uh, takes a, a singular uh, person. So it would be like I gave birth to my child, for example. Um, in 22, uh, we see something similar. Uh, I was married in Matala. Here again, the impersonal prefix is used with a, a verb root that oftentimes takes a singular personal prefix for the subject. Uh, there's also interesting things going on with control of co-reference. So the object of an impersonal construction uh, is co-referential with the subject of a non-impersonal coordinate clause. So in example 23, um, now the son of the leader was beaten until he died, or literally, um, and then uh, he was he was killed, and uh, and he died, the boy of the leader, or the son of the leader. So um, again, I said earlier that uh, object indexation for th uh, third person uh, objects is a zero morph. I'm sorry, that's not indicated here. Uh, but it, it would be indicated after the verb root barred. So uh, the object that it, the the object of that clause is co-referential with the subject of the next clause, uh, which is not impersonal. So this is interesting because it's uh, showing co-reference between an object and a subject, but uh, not the uh, impersonal subject. So the impersonal subject, so the impersonal uh, prefix. Uh, does not control co-reference of the subject of a non-impersonal clause. In terms of non-topical subjects, uh, I have some evidence of that, but uh, I'm still collecting data. Uh, we do have some examples of left dislocation constructions that have the impersonal. So it's this example 24, uh, clothing, they went to buy. So here the object clothing is, uh, is uh, forefronted 
and we see the uh, impersonal prefix is used here. Uh, another notion uh, that is oftentimes associated with topicality is that of referential continuity. So that is tracking a particular referent through the discourse to see uh, if they are referred to multiple times as that indicated somehow in the grammatical coding. So I have uh, in, one interesting example of that that involves the impersonal prefix. So here we have continuing, continuous reference of an indefinite subject. Um, so here indicated by the uh, impersonal prefix. So this will be a, a series of, uh, of segments from a, a, a discourse um, from, from the uh, archive of data that I, I used for my dissertation. So here in example 25, they get the bark of the gaboyanda tree and come and mix it, uh, presumably with water. So here again, we have uh, the impersonal prefix kind of uh, coding some generic group of people. Uh, and then following that, uh, they mix it and when it is ready, they stir it. And uh, when all of the clothing is wet, then they come. So again, here we have uh, the same impersonal prefix used over and over again, referring presumably to the same group of people who are uh, kind of completing these tasks. And then finally, and they dry it. So this is interesting because there's continuous uh, reference, uh, but it's not specifically mentioned who it is. And that actually makes sense if you go back and look at the uh, preceding segment, which is um, if you want a yellow shawl, so the speaker is explaining the process of how you make this yellow shawl. So the actual topic is not uh, who is making the shawl, but the shawl itself and how it is made. So that makes sense in this case uh, that the impersonal is used because uh, the, the agent in all of these clauses is not the topic. Okay, we also see the impersonal used with, uh, with some intransitive roots, uh, specifically in this encoded cum construction. So first, in example 29, this is a non-impersonal construction. This is just to kind of exemplify what this encoded cum construction looks like. So in this construction, you have uh, the lexical verb cum, which is then followed by a verb in this uh, dependent stem construction. Um, and this indicates uh, that uh, the action is uh, starting to occur. So in this example, you come to prepare a place to pass water through here. Uh, this construction is indicating that you, you start to prepare this place to pass water through. And you can actually use this construction with uh, the an impersonal. So in this example, number 30, they came to speak even in the old days um, in this case, from the context, you can tell it means that they came to speak the language, even in the old days. So here we see the impersonal prefix uh, co-occurring with the uh, in, intransitive verb root come, uh, followed by, again, this uh, dependent stem structure uh, with the verb discuss. So this is interesting, again, because it indicates uh, some of the differences that these constructions have with some of the properties typically associated with passive constructions. Uh, notably, the, the impersonal prefix is not used for weather verbs. So in this example 31, it rained and we return to that farming. Here we see that uh, the verb rain will take a third person subject uh, indexation, not the impersonal prefix. Uh, the same can also be said for uh, presentational constructions, although I don't have an example of that here in my slides. Okay, and in terms of the Kalenjin languages, uh, we see many of the same types of constructions that I just showed for SMG to Toga, uh, with some exceptions. Uh, so here from Chernangain, uh, example 32 and 33, Again, we see that uh, there are close similarities between first person plural and impersonal. In this case, they're, they're classed differently. Uh, we do see some interesting differences and I, I do wanna talk about a couple of those. So in Akie, uh, we do have uh, some reported examples of co-occurrence with referential subject NPs. So in uh, 34, uh, the boys are hidden by the women uh, so here we have uh, 
a specific group of women, or at least it, it's indicated in, in the free translation, uh, that there's a specific group of women that are being referred to here. So it's notable on its own because there is a, a lexical subject MP, uh, but also notable because it appears to refer to a specific group of people. In 35, however, this is uh, even more different because uh, the, the subject is, is singular, uh, and not only singular, but it appears to refer to a, a specific entity, an identifiable entity. So in this example, the children have been beaten by mother. Um, here we have this, uh, this uh, what I've called the impersonal construction, which is glossed as passive, uh, used with a, a singular uh, lexical subject NP. So that we do not see um, in Datoka. In a number of Kalenjin languages, there are some interesting similarities uh, between the uh, impersonal prefix and what has been described as the infinitive prefix. So uh, Kreider 2001 says these prefixes are forms of the prefix for first person plural subject. And this context identify the two major conjugational classes of Nandi. The infinitive prefixes may only be used with human actors. So he, he goes on to say, if, uh, if a given verb is associated with an action that is typically done by a non-human actor, then you cannot use these same infinitive prefixes, but rather you would use something that resembles third person subject indexation. Uh, so this is really interesting again, because it, it shows a link between the impersonal prefix and sort of a, another grammatical construction. And this is also something that uh, we, we do not see in Toga. Okay, so now come into the typological analysis of these constructions. So first, uh, should we call them impersonals or should we call them passives? Uh, well, semantically, most of the constructions fall under the scope of indefinite subject coding. And uh, IKEA appears to be the only reported exception to, to that generalization. Uh, also structurally, the constructions code the agent as the subject and the patient as the object. So these two facts together, uh, I argue, support the analysis of these constructions as impersonal constructions. And you could say more specifically as indefinite subject constructions. Uh, in terms of the, uh, some typological generalizations that have been proposed in the literature on impersonals, Zavirska identifies two common indefinite subject construction types, third plural subject indexation and pronominal mon constructions. And, and these two uh, construction types are taken from a, uh, a set of European languages. So most of the uh, third person plural indefinite subject constructions occur in pro-job languages, while the mind constructions occur in uh, non-pro-job languages. Uh, so in Southern Nilotic, the indefinite subject uh, or the impersonal subject is coded um, in a similar fashion to first person plural uh, so that follows the third person plural pattern or the generalization that Sevierska reported uh, because Southern Nilotic languages are pro-job languages. Um, and I would also add that there is some evidence outside of Southern Nilotic in the Eastern and Western Nilotic branches of the Nilotic family that there might be even older sources uh, for this impersonal construction that uh, might not be first person plural. It might actually be third person plural. Uh, Severska also offers a grammaticalization Klein for third person plural and indefinite subject constructions, uh, starting with uh, starting by coding uh, plural definite subjects and then going down this Klein and ending as a uh, passive construction. So if we look at the uh, Southern Nilotic and personal constructions, well, first off, the first person plural obviously refers to definite entities. If we consider that to be separate uh, from the impersonal construction, uh, then we could uh, indicate, um, indicate the, the range of functions uh, that the impersonal construction codes in this way. If you consider them to be the same, then you would just combine these two circles and say that they both cover the same range. Uh, in terms of the Ake impersonals, it appears that Ake has progressed a little bit further and now can be used to refer to singular uh, specific subjects. 
in a, another chapter of the volume on impersonal constructions, a semantic map of impersonals is proposed. Uh, th the relation between this map and the, the five different uh, types of impersonal constructions and the kind of three generalized types of R impersonals and T impersonals and A impersonals, the link is not so clear, um, but here there are uh, different uh, kind of coding mechanisms which are then associated with different semantic properties. So we have differential case marking, agreement loss, word order inversion, and then impersonal passivization, which is not really clarified, uh, and then subject omission. Uh, if we look at where uh, Southern Nilotic and personal constructions would fit, most likely be in this range here, which corresponds to, again, impersonal passivization, uh, which I, I believe could be a, interpreted as referring to indefinite subject constructions, although again, it's not really clarified in the, the, the section of this, that chapter. Um, although one other thing I would add is that it's not necessarily clear that the impersonal construction is coding uh, non-topical subjects rather than uh, indefinite subjects. So if we think back to those examples that I was showing of uh, the impersonal construction in Asimjik to Toga uh, used continuously um, in multiple segments of a discourse, we saw that uh, not only was it non-topical, but it was also non-definite or not also indefinite. So uh, teasing these two apart will uh, require additional data. Uh, so also the link with infinitives is interesting because that has not been reported in the literature. Um, and one interesting this raises, uh, so the link between the impersonal and the infinitives, uh, does that, can we consider an infinitive and impersonal? Well, obviously many people would say no because these two concepts are not often linked together. But if we think back to the, the general uh, definition of impersonals that was offered in the 2011 volume, uh, those, that is uh, a construction without a referential subject, well, infinitives would appear to fall under that, that definition. So uh, we could revise our definition of the concept of the impersonal uh, to be more specific so that we uh, explicitly exclude infinitives. So I'm proposing a, uh, a potential uh, revision of the definition of impersonal as impersonal constructions are constructions that structurally resemble a recognized subject category, but with referential or other semantic properties that differ from that subject category. Now, we also want to exclude passives. So we might have to refine this even further and specify that the most active participant is coded as the subject so that we uh, can still distinguish between impersonal constructions and passive constructions if we desire to do so. Okay, so in conclusion, um, again, I argue that all of these constructions appear to be cognate and could be accurately described as impersonal constructions and more specifically, indefinite subject constructions. Uh, they align with some of the generalizations from the typological literature on impersonal constructions, uh, such as the distribution of third person plural impersonals in European languages and the grammaticalization Klein. Um, they may or may not align with the proposed semantic map, but uh, further research is necessary to uh, determine whether or not they, they align well or not. Uh, also in Kalenjin, there's a, an interesting link between impersonal constructions and infinitive constructions, uh, but also further research of impersonal constructions in other nilotic branches uh, might reveal more about the origins. All right, uh, thank you very much. I will now... Uh, show you my references so you can peruse those while I uh, answer any questions that you might have. Okay, we have a, uh, a comment from Alice Mitchell. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Richard. Very nice presentation. All very clear. One of my favorite uses of this construction in Datoga is when a child comes into a house and says Gegur to someone, which means uh, meaning that someone has been called to another house. They would rarely initially specify who is calling, but there's always a, a definite subject. Uh, so I think there is um, there's something very interesting going on with the pragmatics of this construction. And a comment from Roland Kiesling. Thanks a lot, Richard. Sounds convincing. 
concerning the link or formal identity of impersonal and first person plural, you alluded to tonal differences here. Any elaboration on this? I occasionally see tonal differences in Gisamjanga, but have not been able to figure it out. Uh, yes, yeah, so I don't have a, a broad generalization that I can cite in terms of the the differences between first person plural and um, and the the impersonal construction. Um, I guess all, all I can say is that there 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 typically are well there are differences uh, between the two constructions in terms of tone when there is not a final suffix present. So again, like in the in that exhortative construction. Uh, but otherwise, uh, the tone is oftentimes quite similar. So then the distinction between the two falls on the, the, the presence of the final suffix. So um, exactly the, the, uh, the source of this tonal, these tonal differences, I'm not really sure. And again, as you know, we, the, the, uh, the origins of the inflectional suffix, the final suffix are not totally clear. So how exactly these two constructions developed, um, I'm not really sure. And I've, I've tried to remain mostly agnostic as to whether or not they are the same thing. Obviously, if, if you look at it kind of on the, the word level, uh, there are two different things uh, because of these tonal differences and the, uh, the uh, differences in terms of the, the presence or lack thereof of this final suffix. Uh, but in terms of that prefix, um, there isn't necessarily a reason to say they are different. Uh, segmentally, they appear to be exactly the same. And in terms of the tone that occurs on that prefix, uh, they appear to be the same. Um, so we, you could argue either way, I think. But again, I'm, at least for now, uh, trying to remain mostly agnostic. Also in terms of the diachronic development, um, I think it's, it's typically been Kind of assumed, although not explicitly stated in the literature, that uh, the impersonal developed out of the first person plural because that would kind of be a, a logical progression. But that's not actually necessarily the case. So as I was kind of alluding to, uh, there's there are also impersonal constructions in other Nilotic languages. So like in Maasai, for example, there is an e suffix, uh, which is uh, reported to have developed out of some sort of uh, plural personal marker. So um, whether or not that is directly connected, I think remains to be seen, uh, but that might indicate that there was some other kind of personal marker that served as the, the source for these, these two prefixes, the first person plural and the impersonal. Um, so it's not, not exactly clear what the direction of grammatical change was, what the, the start was and what the end was. So uh, I'm hoping to, to look into that more. Okay, then we've got, uh, let's see, a comment from Andrew. Uh, there's heavy usage of what I've labeled a medial passive voice in Gorwa. This would be an interesting construction to look at alongside the Datoga impersonal for an area-based comparison. And I, I would add that I, I gave a, a, a different version of this talk at a, a colloquium here in Leiden and uh, Martin Mouse on the next day gave a talk about uh, the impersonal construction in Iraq. And um, yeah, it's also very similar, although it's very similar functionally, but uh, uh, in terms of the form, it's, it's totally different. It, it doesn't appear to necessarily be related, although terms of the function and the kind of aerial distribution that's uh, definitely something interesting and something that I hope to look at. Uh, so Alice Mitchell uh, asks, uh, have you thought about whether the C prefix might relate to C the person? I have not thought about that. It's uh, an interesting idea um, and I believe that that um, I believe oh, it's, I don't remember the exact publication. I think it was uh, uh, I think it's one of uh, Mietzner's publications about Chiang Lai that um, she argued that the impersonal prefix might have originally come from the word for person. 
So uh, it, it would be interesting to look at that. Now, it's also interesting that there is this kind of uh, suppletive relationship between C and A or A um, in Datoga and how exactly that developed, um, I, I, I don't know, but you know, it, I could see how that, uh, that the fricative at the beginning of C could easily have come from that uh, voiceless alveolar stop. So um, we, we could probably uh, figure that out if we start to look at uh, enough languages and, and gather the data. Um, so yeah, that is a possibility that C is related to uh, C to any person. Okay, Roland adds, okay, thanks, one more remark. It seems as if Southern Cushitic did toga align in this feature to some extent. Southern Cushitic having a personal proclitic or selector ta with similar properties, but Martin will probably be talking about this soon in Iraq. Yeah, that's true. So Martin is going to give a talk about the impersonal in Iraq. It's not uh, the next talk, but it's a talk he's going to give later on, um, later this fall. Uh, so yeah, we will return to this topic of impersonal constructions and uh, perhaps Martin will have uh, more to share that might help to kind of shed some light on the, the situation of if, if, whether or not these uh, constructions um, have somehow uh, been influenced by each other or if they just developed totally independently. Okay, and Andrew adds that uh, formally uh, the uh, impersonal constructions in uh, Southern Cushitic and Datoga seem very different, uh, but it might be very interesting to look at the uh, pragmatic or discourse functions. All right, well, if there are no other questions or comments, um, I'd like to thank everyone again for participating today. Um, and again, we will uh, post a recording of this webinar on the Rift Valley uh, webinar uh, net, uh, YouTube page. And uh, I will also add an entry for this presentation to the Rift Valley bibliography. So thank you again, and I hope to see you at our next webinar.